characteristic of the 10 to 12 year olds is their range of difference in personality and physical makeup. It is difficult to select typical behavior which fits all families and all cultural patterns, but basically 10s, 11s, and 12s do act their age. Observing these children may help us to be more objective about our own. The more we understand their development, the better we should be able to guide them. Let's take a look at the boys. It's hard now to identify which are the typical traits of the age and which are the child's own personality. One thing they have in common is the messy appearance, noise, and strong language. The differences in size and temperament are very pronounced. Bob, who is just 10, has a slender build. He's good-natured, easygoing, not much of a problem to his family. <laughs> you want to have a game? Okay. I go first. No, I do. Oh, I do. You I do because you went first last time. Then there is Gary, also 10. Still noisy and aggressive, likes to argue, is reckless, and can be as delightful as he can be terrible. Chris, just turned 11, is hard to type. Just boy, his mother says. This is Tony gangling earlier than Bob, yet only a month older. He's quiet, rather tense, and likes the gang, but also likes to be alone. And then there's Fred. Fred's 11. He's tough, very good at sports, not so good at school. Popular with the gang, but sealed in from grown-ups. Hey, why does the cannon roar? I don't know. You'd roar too if you get Smutty jokes, bathroom <laughs> humor, and dirty words all form part of the life of most 10 to 12s. They are again but a loosely knit one. There is no one leader. Leadership shifts as their activities change. Bill and Rod are 12. Bill especially seems to be much more grown up than the tens. He's neater, smoother, a good organizer. They are discussing a full game, completely organized by Bill and Rod, to be played against a rival playground team. No adult was necessary, although they'll invite an adult to referee. Tony will be water boy. Tony knows he can't play football and has learned to accept it. The gang, too, is learning to accept Tony, even if he can't catch or pass. But Chris feels differently. He wants terribly to play quarterback, but he knows he's not good enough. He feels his position with the gang is threatened by his... All the gang discuss Chris's faults frankly. A lot of their time is spent in analyzing each other. Fred knows he's good, feels secure. Perhaps that's why he can afford to be lavish in his compliments of others. Bill is a mature 12. He pretends to dislike girls, but he's interested enough to enjoy teasing them. The 12-year-old girls make no bones about it. They like the boys even if they must be content with the squirts in their class. Rod, who is nearly 13, still hates girls. He thinks Bill is dopey to bother with them. Yes, 12s are all different, too. But what about the 12-year-old girls? Just as with boys, their size varies tremendously. They, too, are all different. They are the result of 12 years of growing up. They all were born with different potentialities, and all have been affected by different upbringings. Now they're beginning to show the sum total of the effect on their various personalities, adults in the making. Mary is still so unsophisticated and still in many ways a little girl. But Betty, exactly the same age, has reached puberty. Her whole outlook is more that of the teens, and she brings the younger ones along with her. A lot of questions related to being grown up concern these girls. Mother always wants to shorten it. She forgets I'm not a baby. May I see a What do these daddy? girls do besides talk? The range of their interests is wide. Besides her dog collection, Betty's hobby is knitting. And she enjoys sports. But the girl's favorite pastime is talk. I think Miss Banks is the biggest jit. I'm 
after all, she asked you what you were writing. Yes, I had finished my work and I was writing a letter to Jane. <laughs> there she goes, uh -huh. walking down the aisle. She didn't even ask me if I'd finish and snatched the book right out of my hand. <laughs> Can I help her if I said she was trying to be a sweater girl? <laughs> She's always so unfair. Catty, sometimes cruel, and always sizing up. Teachers that aren't fair, mothers that are unreasonable. Twelve is both sensitive to and very aware of human relations. And one of the girls tripped her. <laughs> and she punishes us for nothing to do. Yeah. Yes, I had to hey, wear. Look what I found. Ben's diary. Give me that. No, give me it. No, you let Isabel read it. I did not. You did so. I did not. You did so. She even told well, me. Well, she's a lie. Wait till I get that crumb. I'll show her. Get off the chair. Well, Isabel told me that you let her read it. And well, so the diary is forgotten, and Isabel is made the goat. Betty decides to write her a fiery note. They conspire to toss out a friend. At this age, you may be in one moment and out the next. Poor Isabel won't have a clue as to what the note's about, as it may be possible that Jane made up the whole story. Girls' relations with each other go through so many different stages that it's best for their parents to leave well enough alone as they practice getting along with others. Girls have more poise than the boys do and a budding social instinct that makes them say the thing that pleases. Do you like some cookies, girls? Thank you. Oh, they look oh, good. They're good. delicious. They're right out of the oven. You're looking mm. Are they ever super? Thank you. Mother always buys the old dry kind at the store. Oh, I'm sure she makes some for you sometimes. You have new sweaters, haven't you? Oh, yes, I just got them yesterday. They look very smart. Thank you very much. Darling, it's uh, nearly six o'clock. Time to send the gang home, don't you think? In a few more minutes. Well, no. don't be long, eh? No. Bye-bye. No. Bye. 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 Gee, Mother's nice. My mother wouldn't let me have cookies near the supper time. Oh, my mother doesn't give me much trouble. What about that, Miss no. Keeley? Oh, and so they're oh, off again, no. sizing up parents and comparing them freely with their friends' parents. Homemade specialties are lost on these wolves. However, Mrs. Jones prefers to have the messy, noisy gang hanging around her front step, where at least she has some idea what they're doing. Mrs. Jones starts on the evening chores. This seems to be one of her main functions these days, getting her daughter and her two sons to do their chores and homework, and of course, feeding them. She often wonders if Fred's sullen, at times even rebellious attitude is due to his special personality, or is it typical of some 11-year-olds and a phase that will pass. He seems to have trouble accepting adult authority. She feels he does this weekly chore only because other members of his gang have to do it. Mrs. Jones sometimes sees life as a chain of minor irritations. How is Fred would pick up his boots? Bob, you to do your homework upstairs. We need the table for supper. Okay, Mom. Is this yours? No, that's Fred. Dear. Betty, get off that phone. In a few more minutes, Mom. Yeah? Oh, it's all right. It's just Mom. Yeah, I will. Betty's father works in an accounting office. Mr. Jones is easygoing, like Bob, and thoroughly enjoys his children although he finds Betty's endless telephone conversations very irritating. He'll get Betty to set the table. Fathers can be completely unreasonable at times, according to their daughters. Mr. Jones doesn't handle this as his wife would, but father and daughter have to work out their own relationship. Brother and sister bickering goes on, but not as frequently as it used to, thank heavens. Of course, Betty thinks the boys are completely spoiled. As the eldest, she feels it's her solemn duty to lay down the law for the younger ones. Oh, so dirty. Hi, Dad. Hi, son. What were the results in the game last night? Well, now, let's see. Sharing interests is one of the great satisfactions of this age. The boys now follow the sports page as closely as their father. It's a couple of games to win. Yes, it's a lot better than the last one. Yeah. I think we're getting there now. 
Dad, can I have the comics? Well, don't you think you'd better finish your homework first? Say, how about yours, Fred? The 11 sullen attitude to any routine task is exasperating to the best of parents. Mrs. Jones tries to make the dinner hour a happy one. The children are more interested now in current events and activities that interest the parents. Oh, no, not that telephone again. Children of this age are past masters at assessing the changing moods of their parents. Don't your friends ever eat dinner? Yeah. <clears throat> this time, Betty takes the hint. The next morning, the Jones family is involved in the usual breakfast rush. Bye, Dad. Bye, bye, dear. Bye, Mom. Take Thank care you. of yourself. Thanks. Bye, sweetheart. Bye, Dad. Hurry up, dear. We're going to be late. Folk. Darling, put your coat on this morning. It's cold. Okay, Mom. Mom, I feel awful. What's wrong, dear? I got a tummy ache. Sure. Yes. No honest. tests at school today? No, honest, I got a, I feel awful. Well, then you run upstairs and I'll be up later. Right. He's not sick, he's just afraid to go to school. He had a big fight at the football game. Crockett swore the referee and Mr. Foster had to put him off the field. Mr. Foster was unfair. Fred was right, Mom. Yeah, but he shouldn't have blown up like that. You should have heard him swearing, Mom. All right, all right. Off to school, both of you. Mrs. Jones is worried. Is Betty right? Is Fred pretending? Mom, I came for my glass of milk. Well, tell me, Fred, I hear you had trouble at the football game yesterday. Who called you? I didn't do anything. Mr. Foster cheated. I don't care what he says. He was wrong. Okay. We'll talk about it later. Mrs. Jones knows that Fred's outburst means trouble. But what kind of trouble? And how to handle it? Fred's so hard to get at. She decides to let things cool down. This may be one for father to handle. Meanwhile, at school, Bob's class is a typical sixth grade room. The desire to please runs high at this age, especially among the girls. These 10-year-old girls are not the young ladies the 12-year-old girls are. They have a crush on their teacher and blush easily. The boys are often more straightforward than girls. In this case, they admit to not having finished their homework. The girls sit tight, but if they are checked, they are quick with an excuse. But on the whole, the girls are better than boys in schoolwork. They are often as much as a whole year ahead in language skills. Daydreaming, the constant bane of teachers. What are you thinking about? Nothing. Nothing may be precisely what he is thinking about. It's usually the boys that invent the mischief. And it's always the girl that tells. But they can take their punishment. Perhaps not in too convincing a manner, but in good grace. This age needs to have this period of concentration relieved by periods of strenuous play. Let's see what's happening at home this afternoon. Fred is feeling more amiable, but something is obviously still worrying him. Mrs. Jones takes this opportunity to try and get him interested in reading. He's a slow reader and so seldom relaxes with a book the way Bob and Betty do. Fred's crazy about dogs. Perhaps this will hold his interest.
Father is a bit nervous about how to approach Fred. Mr. Jones knows a wrong move on his part may make Fred draw back into his shell. So he first encourages him to tell his version of what happened at the game. Perhaps it would be easier to explain on paper. Fred is still convinced that the referee, Mr. Foster, gave an unfair penalty. Did you storm and swear at Mr. Foster? Yes, but he was wrong, Dad. Yes, Fred, no doubt you thought he was wrong at the time. But the rules say that you have to abide by the referee's decision. You see, Fred, you may have thought you were right, and you may have been. It's hard to tell now. But you were wrong in losing your temper. And for that, you may have to take your medicine. And that may mean getting kicked off the team. About the comics? Sure, and so the conflict in Fred is in the open. He was both right and wrong, and it was enough to put to bed for a day. Children of this age have more understanding of their own behavior than we often give them credit for. Mr. Jones wonders if Fred can take it if this is news of suspension. Yes, he's been dropped from the team. But Fred tells his father, the gang claim they'll soon get him back again. And so Fred's world closes up again. The gang's on his side. To Fred, this was part of the worry. Mr. Jones can only hope that Fred learned something useful from the whole incident. But there are many situations that the family may never know about. The kids know this is against the law, but a half-built house is very enticing. Though they don't realize it, this little trick will cost the owner money. Bob knows this can get them into trouble, but he can't risk being called chicken by the gang. Someone's coming. What have they been doing? The traditional nothing. She has to trust them. What else can she do? How can the Joneses build self-discipline in the boys that will keep pranks from becoming destructive and leading to serious trouble? Here are indirect ways to build this sense of responsibility. Doing things with as well as for them. Working out the family rules and regulations together. Providing opportunities for group activities can help in developing an inner discipline. And as they get older, giving greater freedom. Helping them identify with the man in the house by doing men's jobs. And humor will help keep good relations in the family. Knock, knock. Who's there? Eisenhower. Eisenhower who? Eisenhower late for breakfast. Oh, Dad! <laughs> but what about the girls? Is it all sweetness and light with them? Why can't it end at 11? has been settled once and for all, Betty. Your party is to end at 10.30. Keep your shirt on, Mother. I'm asking if Coach is 11. Everybody thinks 10.30 is too early. I don't care You're what anybody... You're treating us like babies. The old cry, coupled with, you don't understand me, leaves both parents and children frustrated. But Mrs. Jones won't be pressured into what everyone else is doing every time. The party is to end at 10.30. The night of the Halloween party. All the family pitches in, disagreements all forgotten, as Betty nervously directs operations. Hi. Hi. You've got a pretty dress. Thanks. Love my oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, any boys coming? Yes. Give it back. Shove it with oh. the The girls always arrive in a group. And all the boys, as if by magic, arrive two minutes later. 
The opportunity for boys and girls to get together socially at this age helps their development. The Jones provide this by having a dance. <laughs> No one is going to be the first to ask girl to dance. Everyone is still waiting for something to break the ice. Betty hopes to get things going with the game. Now they've got something to do. Square dancing and Virginia reels are also fun at this age. In the end, dancing, after a fashion, is indulged in by everyone. have stayed out of the way, but their near presence has kept things in hand. <laughs> Sorry, children. 10.30. Time to go. Oh. Oh. Just one more dance? No, dear. Mother's at 10.30, remember? Oh. So at about 12 years of age, the girls and boys come together again after a period of almost four years of mutual disdain. Thank you, Joan. You're welcome, dear. Thank you very much. That's all right, son. Thank you very, very much. It's lovely. Bye. Thank you. All right, dear. Bye. 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 Bye, children. Come again. Bye. Bye. Probably the boys won't speak to the girls until the next party. Betty wants desperately to walk the gang home but realizes it's hopeless. The party was an obvious success, and Betty's happiness is mother and dad's reward. Their little girl is growing up into a graceful young lady. As for Fred, what is he thinking? Is he daydreaming, planning, worrying? Only occasionally do we sense the conflicts that exist in our children's world. And Bob, well, at least he's quiet and safe when asleep. Children this age are no longer little boys and girls, but instead young individuals who are independent, sometimes responsible, often very discerning, always testing, striving, living to the hilt, with deep currents of feeling often hidden from view. The differences are very apparent. We should cherish their uniqueness, seek out their assets, and encourage their abilities. The coming teens will not transform the child. All the more reason to understand the 10 to 12s. <laughs> 